Uh, tonight I want to talk about the four Satipatthanas and basically go through and get a, a broad picture of the practice that we're doing. Of course, the, the practice is incredibly simple. Whatever happens, be aware of it. That's it. <laughs> but of course, that's far too simple for us. We have to make it complicated. So we keep making it complicated, often by arguing with whatever it is which is happening. Because we, we, we bring an agenda with us. We want certain things to happen. And we don't want other things to happen. And so when the things that we want aren't happening, and the things that we don't want are happening, then we get agitated and we think, I must be doing it wrong. There's got to be something else to it. Are you sure it's supposed to work like this? How long does it take? And so on and so forth. And we get away from the radical simplicity of just what's happening. When we start to actually get into it, it becomes very complex, in a sense. And I guess because the, the mind is complex, and we're working with the mind, and the human mind is infinitely complex. In one discourse, the Buddha was sitting around with his students, and he said, I could talk about the four Satipatthanas for a hundred years and not repeat myself. Fortunately for them, he didn't. <laughs> but obviously, he had a lot to say about it. Although, it's, as I say, it's in its essence, it's, just, it's, it's radically simple. So tonight I just want to go through, have a look at, by going through the four domains. Remember the, the four satipatthanas could be seen as the four applications or the four contemplations, the four activities of contemplating body, tracking the body, um, tracking feeling, tracking mind, tracking phenomena, or it could be seen as the four domains, four foundations of body feeling, mind, phenomena. It can refer to the activity itself or what it is that we're working on. Here I want to go through the four domains, but first of all, just to reiterate what we mean by mindfulness. Often people use the term mindfulness and awareness synonymously, but they're not quite the same. The Buddha was very precise with his language and he developed a whole vocabulary of technical terms to express precisely what he was getting at. This morning we, we spent some time exploring this idea of Vedana, feeling. And of course, although he's very precise, he's not really being scientific because what he's, to, he's, he, what he's doing, he's, he's groping for language to communicate experience and it's quite intimate experience. And so it's not really science, it's more like poetry. But there's an accuracy to it. So there is a, a precision to the way that he uses words. Sati, usually translated as mindfulness, is a technical term. We've been looking at it in, as presence, being present to the experience. Now this certainly involves awareness. If I'm present to something, I'm aware of it. If I'm absent, if I'm out to lunch, I'm not aware of it. So they're obviously very close. But sati, remember, literally means memory. And we can see where the Buddha is coming from if we, when we look at the experience of distraction. How is it that we are distracted? In particular, how is it that we are distracted so easily? and so readily. It's astonishing how easily it happens. One moment where A-grade, first-rate, export-quality meditator, and if only people could see into our minds, they'd be really impressed. And the next moment, 50,000 miles away. How does it happen? And, of course, it happens through forgetting. We keep forgetting. We forget what is present, we forget to be present. And then in forgetting, suddenly we're absent and we don't even know that we're absent. We're distracted and we don't know that we're distracted because we're forgotten. And so then somewhere down the track, we remember, ah, oh, it's 
supposed to be meditating. Mindfulness is the act of remembering. Remembering what is present. Ah, I'm lost in a daydream. Remembering to be present. Have to be aware. We remember and are aware. But mindfulness really is, is this act of remembering. So it has a kind of active quality to it. When the Buddha talks about meditation in the Eightfold Path, he talks about it in terms of the three factors of right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, in that order. You can see how right effort, effort or energy, that's the active side of the practice. Samadhi, usually translated concentration, is more the receptive side. It's very peaceful, receptive. Mindfulness is in the middle, but it's, it's, it's very close to the, to the energy factor. It has an energetic quality to it. Uh, it's an action, an activity. The activity of remembering. This is the, the essence of what we're doing. We're training ourselves, we're training our memories, but we're training to remember the present rather than the past. We remember what is present, and what is present are the four Satipatthanas, body, feeling, mind, phenomena. We remember to be present, which is the contemplation, the tracking of body, feeling, mind, phenomena. It begins with body, and we've spent a lot of time in this retreat, working with body. It's the foundation. The Buddha's approach to meditation is very embodied. This is something which perhaps has been lost sight of in the, in the modern traditions. Sometimes the, the body seems to have been forgotten or, or shoved out of the way in the way that meditation practice is talked about or presented. It's presented some, sometimes as a purely of the mind or the spirit or whatever. But it's perfectly obvious as soon as we sit down that it's all about the body. And in fact, clearly, you know, look, you look at the modern methods, most of them begin with the body. Some don't. Sometimes you get practices that direct, direct the awareness straight into the mind. But that's unusual. Uh, mostly you're directed towards the body. So, and when we look at body and we ask, well, what is it? We can look at body in the broad sense, the posture. And the Buddha talks about it in terms of walking, standing, sitting, lying down. But, po but body in the broad sense, the body is a field of awareness and the balance of it. If we're going to develop concentration, a concentration is associated with stillness. So we need to keep the body still over a period of time, or if it's moving, moving in a very steady kind of way. As soon as we attempt to keep the body still, we realise how difficult it is. When we're not used to it, we do it and it hurts. And it doesn't matter how comfortable we try to get, it hurts. The body's constantly moving. Why does the body move? It moves because it's constantly trying to get comfortable. That's why it moves. Which means it's chronically uncomfortable. And the inherent pain of the body is covered over, disguised, by movement, by the change of posture. So when we're asked to stay still, maintain this posture for a period of time, it hurts. It, it, it's difficult. So posture in terms of the meditation practice is all about sustainability. To, to maintain a posture or a series of postures over a period of time. And that takes training, and it's a physical training. So this posture in the broad sense, the sense of the whole body, which also come, come into the meditation, sometimes as we sit, our primary object might be the entire body, as a whole field of, of awareness and of energy. Then this body, in the more narrow sense, of discrete physical elemental movements or sensations. So when we talked about the elements, the four Mahabhuta, the four great appearances, earth, air, fire, water, when we go into the detail of the body, that's what we find. The thing about the body, of course, is that as a meditation object, it has two major advantages, which we've 
oh, I think we've already spoken of. The first and most obvious is that the body is always right now. The body is always in the present. The mind is mostly in past and future, disconnected from the present. It's like the present for the mind is rather like the transit lounge in an airport. It's just you, you briefly touch base there and then head off on the next flight. So we have this sense of the present as being this tiny little edge between past and future. And really, most of the time, past and future is not only much bigger than the present, but it's for us it's much more real. So we're rushing through the present in order to get to the future where things really start to happen. And we find ourselves living like this and, and running around. And of course, when we are in past and future, we are disconnected from the body. We actually don't know what's happening with the body. So we accumulate tension and tightness and, and so on in the body over, over time. When we come back to the body, we come back to now. The body is always right now, always. We can see it, for example, when we're sitting and suddenly the you know, the pain in the body is building up and suddenly it really starts to hurt. And all of the fantasies just vanish. And it's just, oh my God, it hurts. Ugh! And it's right now. And the present suddenly gets a lot bigger. You know, past and future shrink and the present becomes much bigger. So body is a is, is very good meditation object because it's always in the present. So coming back to the body Dropping the thinking and returning to the body is a really good basic meditation exercise. But when I say basic, not, not in the sense that we do it for a few days and then forget about it, but something to keep returning to year after year after year. So body is present and secondly, body is clear. According to the Buddha, all sense experience comes about through a sense object striking its sense organ or sense sensitivity. The Buddha says there are six senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Broadly speaking, body is, includes the five physical senses of eye, ear, nose, tongue, but this fifth sense, body in the narrow sense, means receptivity to tactile sensation. And the tradition says that the impact of sense objects striking sense organ with eye, ear, nose, tongue is like cotton striking cotton the impact of sense organ on sense, a, a sense object on sense organ or sense sensitivity with body and touch is like a hammer striking an anvil. Whammo! It's really clear. So again, it's very practical for a meditation object. So we, so we start with the body. Then comes feeling, Vedana, which we talked about this morning. Vedana is the affective, hedonic aspect of experience. It is how we feel. It's like the flavour of the experience. As we said, it's like when we eat, we get a whole series of physical experiences. The hardness of the food, the softness, dryness, wetness, stickiness, slipperiness, and so on and so forth. All the sensations involved crunchiness, smoothness, and so on, that are involved in eating, but we also have the flavour. And the flavour is different from all those physical sensations, but it's intimately linked to them. And it's the flavour that moves us. If it's a nice flavour, we're moved to take more. If it's a bad flavour, we're moved to take less. So. Vedana or feeling is like the flavour of the experience and it's wrapped up in every experience. Every experience has flavour. Every, exper every experience has the capacity to move us, not just the capacity to move us. Every experience does, in fact, move us. In the, the Buddha's teaching, when he talks about dependent arising, his model of causation, he says, contact conditions feeling. Contact is the immediacy of, of experience. That moment, boom, of experience is contact or stimulation. Contact conditions feeling. This does not mean that we have the immediacy of experience 
boom, and then later on, feeling emerges. What it means is, when there is contact, there is already feeling. And if there's contact, there is feeling. There's always feeling with contact. So they, they come wrapped up together. It's very, very intimate. And of course, feeling conditions craving. Now craving, tanha, this is one of those key terms. Tanha literally means thirst, but it's usually in English translated as craving. Tanha, or thirst, or craving, refers to that deep, unquenchable lack. This deep sense of something missing at the core of our being that causes us to reach out to get something, anything, to, to satisfy it, to fill it up. So thirst, we're constantly thirsty, we're constantly reaching out for something to quench our thirst. But it doesn't matter how much we drink, we're still thirsty, so we keep drinking. This thirst is stimulated, is conditioned by feeling. But this relationship is not necessary. It is possible to have feeling, to be moved by experience, but not to have craving. And it's in that relationship that the possibility for freedom emerges. So that relationship is very important, and this is what and we study it in this practice. So feeling is what moves us. I am moved by experience. I am moved to hold on to what is pleasant, to resist and reject what is painful, to ignore or to doubt or be confused about what is neither painful nor pleasant. The two obvious movements are the first two. I am moved to hold on to what is pleasant, to push away what is painful. I like this, I want more of it. I don't like that, get it away. This is all about the way that we respond to experience. And this is crucial. Things happen. How do I respond? What do I do about it? How am I being pushed around? by experience? How am I driven? And what is it that drives me? How is it that I keep doing these things? How is it that I keep being thrashed by these obsessions? How is it that, I, that I'm stuck in these habits of behaviour? And so on. It's all about what moves us, which is often what drives us, or what lures us lures us on, you know, what attracts us from beyond. It's how we respond to experience and it's bound up with feeling. So we start with body and body, in a sense, is fundamentally stupid. Uh, it's got, there are, there's no ethical implications in body awareness. Zip. Feeling as soon as we come to feeling, we're into the fact that we respond to experience and how we respond. In other words, suddenly we're moving into an area of how do I live? What am I doing with my life? In other words, we've entered into the realm of ethics. Ethics in the broad sense. When I talk about ethics here, I'm talking about the fact that each one of us is faced with a with, with fundamental question, which is, how should I live? Here I am, I'm on this planet for some mysterious reason. What do I do? How should I live? And all of us come up with an answer to this question. It's not necessarily one that we've thought out, but all of us have an answer. And that answer is our ethics. So how we live, what we do. And when we start to look at that, how we formulate that answer, what we are move, how we are moved to live, it's based on feeling. It's feeling which moves us. So getting to know feeling is very important. So this second 
domain of mindfulness, feeling, then naturally takes us into the third, which we haven't spoken about much. Um, and this is citta, usually translated mind. But again, we have to be careful with translation here. When the, uh, get the Buddha's using his own technical language and there are no exact English equivalents for a lot of these terms. So a lot of the translations, even the most common and basic ones, are actually mistranslations because there is no exact equivalent to what the Buddha is talking about. So we have to be always very careful about translation. So citta, usually translated as mind, but this can give the wrong idea. For us, the word mind has a very heady kind of quality to it. So we might say, well, if you ask someone, well, where's the mind? Oh, what's up here? And what does it do? What do you do with it? Oh, it thinks. It's all about thinking. And then if you ask, well, but what about emotions? Ah, that's the heart. That's down here. So we tend to separate what we call emotions from what we call mind. Uh, sometimes when I'm talking to people about meditation, they'll talk about the mind. And I have to ask, well, what do, you, what do you mean? And often what they mean is thinking. Now that's quite normal for you know, the Western tradition, which has, is based on this very strong duality between mind here and body there, two completely separate substances. But that's not the way that the Buddha operates. Chitta, usually translated mind, is essentially the aware centre of a person. Or we could say it's the subjectivity that experiences. It's our inner centre of, sub of subjectivity. It could be translated mind. It could be translated heart. Sometimes you get the compromised translation of heart-mind. It could be translated soul in the original sense of the word, not the theological sense of, again, something completely disembodied and permanent but in the original sense of the alive essence of a person. But the important thing to remember is that for the Buddha, citta is not radically separate from the body. It's always bound up with body. If there's a citta, there's a body. And if there's a body, an alive body, there's the citta. It's, it's intimately bound up. So we mentioned that the one term that the Buddha uses to describe the human being is, is satvinyana kaya. Kaya, body, satvinyana, with consciousness. So a sentient body. If there's a sentient body, well, first of all, it's a body, but if it's a sentient body, it's a body that knows. What is it that's doing the knowing? It's the citta. In the Satipatthana Sutta, so in the context of this practice, citta is not given an exact definition. The Buddha doesn't attempt a precise definition. It's used in a general sense to indicate one's, one's general state, how one is at this time. So, for example, we have the general greeting when we meet someone. How are you? And we kind of routinely say, good. If, we, if someone said, how are you? And then you stopped and you thought, well, how am I? And you went inside and really and felt it and then came out with a completely honest response. What you would be presenting would be your citta. And if 10 minutes later someone else says, how are you? And you go through the same routine, you might respond with something very different. In other words, the chitter has changed. It's not permanent. It moves all the time. So how, way, how one is at this time, it's very close to what we would call mood. And, so, and it's this that is the third domain in terms of the investigation in this practice, we go into ourselves how we are now. And how do we get there? Well, one of the easiest ways to get into it is through feeling, Vedana, through the, the perceived flavour or feel of an experience. How are you? 
now? How do you feel now? They're very, very close. Those two questions are very, very close to each other. How do we develop a sensitivity to our inner state? How do we discover what it is? We can't think our way into it. How do you come up with an answer to that question, a genuine answer to that question? We have to feel our way into it. Uh, similarly with the body. How do we get into the body? How do we deeply experience the body? We can't think our way in there. and We can't force our way in there through sheer willpower. We have to feel our way in there. And so Vedana is, is like the hinge. Start with body, from body through to feeling, through to heart. But how do we get into the body? We feel our way into the body. How do we get into the heart? We feel our way into the heart. So in one sense, feeling is actually the hinge that, that the whole thing spins around. The practice begins with the body, it matures into the contemplation of the heart-mind. And for both of these, we have to feel our way into them. So the contemplation of the citta, this third domain, is all about developing a sensitivity to the state of our heart, our inner state. And this involves both how we feel, which is Vedana, and how we are moved to respond, to act. What moves us to action? When we get into this area, we're getting into the citta, the heart, the mind, heart-mind. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, in the discourse, when the Buddha starts talking about this, he begins with becoming sensitive to whether or not the heart is coloured by the three <coughs> akusala mula, the, the blind forces of attraction, aversion, delusion. Is my heart accompanied by attraction, desire, yearning, wanting, craving, or not? Is my heart accompanied by aversion, resistance, dislike, irritation, anger, aggression, or not? Is my heart accompanied by delusion, confusion, bewilderment, doubt, and so on, or not. The contemplation of the citta is very much about the ethical dimension. What is it that colours the heart, and how is it moved to act? In other words, how do I live? And what is it that's moving me to live in this way? And, and of course it's an ongoing thing. One aspect of the contemplation of the citta is seeing the choices that we make from moment to moment, the intentions or choices that we make, uh, which we're constantly making. We're constantly making choices. For example, if we, we're sitting and walking and suddenly obsession comes up, there's always some kind of trigger, some kind of reminder, and then we register it click, there it is, and then we make a choice. I think I'll just go along with this. And whammer, there it is. And of course we don't notice the choice because we've made it so often that it's dropped deep beneath the radar. And we assume it's happening to us. We assume that we're being flogged again by this obsession. But when we look deeply, we begin to see, wait a minute, I'm doing this. And that's a really powerful discovery to make because once I recognize that, then I also realize I can stop doing it. Suddenly, there's a choice. A, a choice becomes possible. Where before, there was none. If I don't see it, there's no choice. I'm, stu I'm stuck. It's just the tapes are rolling. But if I see it, there's an alternative. And that alternative means there's freedom. And the more I see the possibility of choice, the greater the freedom. And I can start to move in a different direction. And the direction that I pick, remember the discourse to the Kalamas, 
when you see for yourselves, well, first of all, we have to see for ourselves. Normally we don't. When you see for yourselves, these things are harmful. These things lead to harm and suffering. Then don't do it. When you see for yourselves, these things lead to welfare and happiness. Then do it. So, in other words, there's freedom. There's a possibility of taking another direction. And this possibility emerges through the contemplation of the citta. But the citta is very subtle, and in order to have a foundation from which we can start to work with it, generally we need to work with the body to get a good foundation. Tomorrow morning we'll start working with the citta. So we don't talk much about it in the early stages of a retreat because we need time to settle, usually, before we can really get in and start exploring it. Of course, once it becomes part of one's practice, then it's always available, because the citta is always available. It's like the body is always available. The body is always doing something. The mind is always available. The mind is also always doing something. But if we're talking about what can change my life, we're talking about the citta not the body. If we want to transform, it's the citta. When the Buddha talks about liberation, what is it that's liberated? It's the citta. When he talks about bondage, what is it that's bound? It's the citta. So this third domain is is of crucial importance. So the first three domains, body, feeling, heart, mind, pretty much seems to cover the whole territory. So what's the fourth domain doing there? This fourth domain has two aspects to it. First is the contemplation of the Dharma. And this is all about understanding. This is all about insight. We talk about being present. Just come back to the present. Just come back to the present. So it's like we've got our noses fixed firmly on this, just one thing at a time. And we do this because we want to develop some kind of understanding. But understanding requires a broader framework. It's like every time that we note the present experience, it's like we're putting the awareness here, and then put it 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 here, and and so on. And that's the work, the, sl- the daily slog, 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 slog. At some point, we start to get a sense of the bigger picture. And we start to connect these dots. We start to see patterns. We start to see a broader picture. And it comes about through the recognition of patterns. We can't get the patterns unless we can see the specifics this, this, this. But the, the practice is more than just these specifics. After some time, we begin to, to recognize that there are patterns emerging. And it's from the patterns that insight arises. Primary object, secondary object. Focus on the primary object and really stay with it. But when we are pulled away to something else, acknowledge that, recognise it. Ah, this is what it is. In other words, we're starting to build up a broader picture than if we were simply and exclusively just on one single experience all of the time. What happens is we develop a sensitivity to context. We begin to get a sense of what's happening around the primary object. We begin by seeing that the mind moves. It's pulled away from the primary object. We begin, then begin to understand how the mind moves. What is it that pulls it away from the primary object? Once we start to see that, what we're seeing is how we are moved, how we respond, how we are pushed and pulled by the the raw energies of the mind. What is it that moves the heart? Well, what is it that prevents me 
from just being at ease with my chosen object of meditation. That's what moves me, because it's just moved me into distraction, and it does it again and again. So what is it? What is it that moves me, and how am I moved? So we begin to recognize a broader picture. If we were simply and exclusively staying on one object, we would not get this broader picture. The broader picture shows us the patterns of activity, and that's where insight comes from. By opening out to the fact of distraction, by recognizing it, by seeing that we are moved and how we are moved, then we're not putting the lid on. We are developing a stronger mind through concentration, through the relationship to the primary object but we're allowing ourselves to open out to see something much broader, such a bigger, much bigger picture and develop an understanding through that. This fourth domain in the sutta begins with the study of our obstacles, which you haven't actually looked at yet, the classical five hindrances. What is it that gets in the way? What prevents me from being at ease? And these are presented as the classical list of the five hindrances, sense, desire, malice or hatred, stiffness and torpor, usually translated sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and doubt or uncertainty. Then the, the Buddha in this section looks at those qualities of the heart or aspects of the mind that move us towards awakening and that characterise awakening itself. And these are the seven factors of awakening. Mindfulness, investigation of phenomena, energy, rapture, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And these two sections are, are, are the essence of this fourth domain. It's looking at what is it that gets in the way and really getting to understand it, to study our obstacles, to get to know them. Not push them away, but get to know them and understand them. What are they? How do they behave? What do they do? And then on the flip side, cultivating those qualities that strengthen and clarify the mind and allow us to navigate through those obstacles. Uh, the contemplation of the Dharma puts all of this into a context. It's enabling us to read our experience. So if you think about the process of what goes on in the interview with the, with the teacher, the student talks about their experience and there's some kind of feedback coming back. If the interview process is working well, what's happening is the student is learning to read the experience. In other words, to find out what it means. Now, meaning requires context, a broader context. A meditation is not simply about having a set of experiences. Experiences are very easily come by. I think in this area you can buy them quite easily, can't you? It's, experiences are not, are not difficult. Uh, some people, particularly when we're young, we can have spontaneously have experiences which the traditions would recognize immediately as, as quite significant um, spiritual experiences. But if the person having the experience doesn't recognize it as such, if the person having the experience can't read, read it, then what is it? It either has no meaning, it's just, wow, that was weird, man, and forgotten, or it gets some other meaning attached to it which often, if it's an unusual experience, can be quite painful. Certainly this culture tends to medicalize unusual experiences. Oh, you're not normal? Here, take this pill. I mean, was the Buddha normal? <laughs> One would sincerely hope not. <laughs> this, this culture has, is very limited in, the, in, in its capacity to, to recognize experiences or, above all, to read them, to, to see the meaning that's there. The Dharma gives us a framework in which we can read the experience and extract meaning from it. 
And it's this which enables us to transform our lives. It's this which changes our lives. It's not having the big experience. A big experience is just the big experience. That's all. You know, wow, I was blessed out. That was fantastic. It was great. And you know, five years, ten years, twenty years down the track, if you can still find someone willing to sit and down and listen to this big experience that you had, well, you're doing well. But it's just a memory. The past is of no interest if it's just another experience. But if it has meaning, then we can integrate it into ourselves and we change, we transform, we develop in some way. And then there's this person, this new person, who has today's experience. And it's a whole different scenario. But to find meaning in experience, we must learn to read it. And the Dharma gives us a way of reading it. Hence, these, you know, we're going through these terms, we're going through this literature, telling these stories about the Buddha. The stories about him and about that, the, the people around him give us an opportunity to make meaning out of our experience today. And that's what's significant. It's like um, if I could venture, venture into theological territory, which I'm tempted to do because of where we are. Uh, it, it often surprises me when Christians argue either with themselves or with non-Christians about whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. So it's an unanswerable question, but it's a completely irrelevant and trivial question. The real question is, what does it mean? What does his rising from the dead mean? If it means something to me, then it will change my life. If it doesn't mean something to me, it won't. So meaning is, is fundamental. And so that's why we plug into the traditions, a tradition. Because the tradition, part of its job, an important part of its job, is to take the experience, whatever the experience is, and give it meaning. And with that meaning, to make it possible to um, change the way that we live. So that's the contemplation of the Dharma. Then we have the contemplation of the Dharmas, plural. This is essentially contemplating the emptiness of phenomena. The Dharmas are phenomena. They are experiences which come and go according to conditions which are not me and not mine. Uh, for example, I might be sitting meditating and suddenly I'm caught up in a narrative. And the narrative is a drama of particular significance and interest because it stars me. And therefore, it's really, really important that I find out how it ends. And so that's why I find it difficult to drop it to come back to the meditation object because I've got to see how it pans out even if I recognise very quickly that this particular movie has been played... Oh, there's, there's holes up there, that's why it's so cold. Um, you know, this particular drama has been played out at least 20,000 times before, so I know exactly how it's going to end, but still I've got to stick around to see the ending one more time, just to make certain that this is how it ends. So, this is... <laughs> I think I must have said the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I forgot where I was. <laughs> Oh, that's right, caught up in the dramas. <laughs> and this is relating to the narratives as self, as me and mine. And this is the normal that way that we relate. Let's say I'm meditating, and this exactly the same narrative pops up. And I recognise it as, ah, this is just another narrative that comes and goes according to conditions. 
It's, it's not me and it doesn't belong to me. It's just stuff flowing through the mind. When I relate to it in that way, I am contemplating the emptiness of the dharmas. I'm seeing it's just phenomena and it's empty. So this is the contemplation of the dharmas, plural. Uh, similarly, with, if I'm caught up in familiar emotion, this is me and I am angry or I want or I need or I am frustrated or whatever. I'm caught up in self. But if an emotion arises and I recognise, ah, that's just the emotion of such and such and it has these characteristics. This is what it does. This is what it feels like. I feel it in the body of this here and then it does that and so on and so forth. Then I'm contemplating the emptiness of the emotion. I'm contemplating the dharmas. This aspect of the fourth domain represents a mature practice where we see whatever it is that we experience, whether body, feeling, heart, mind, is just stuff, just empty phenomena coming and going. And so this is the maturity of the practice. But although it's mature, it's not something which we don't do yet. It's not something that we postpone until we're sufficiently worthy to, to do it. Every time that we note an experience, we are contemplating the emptiness of the dharmas. We are doing this fourth domain, this fourth contemplation. Every time we get caught up in something and then note it, be deliberately aware of it, in that moment we are seeing it as empty phenomena and its grip on us is loosening. Although we, we, we can talk about emptiness as something you know, quite profound, far off and mysterious, in fact we're doing emptiness all of the time. When we are present, we are present to emptiness because that's all that's here. There is no self. There never was one. So this fourth uh, this aspect of the fourth domain is like an underground river. It, like it, it, per it permeates everything. But there are certain times when it becomes particularly obvious, particularly clear, that there's really no one here to hang on and there's nothing worth hanging on to. And this is when everything flows most readily most naturally, when the practice becomes, becomes very natural. It's just this, it's just what's happening. I think that's enough for tonight. Thank you.